two efficiency measures we use. The first is one called the primary filter efficiency. And what that is, is it's a measure of, um, of the number of rows selected by the primary filter, how many of them ended up being correct, essentially. So the primary filter selected B, C, and D, and of those, B and C were, were correct. So our primary filter efficiency in this case was 66%. Um, the internal filter efficiency is another measure, and this one says of the rows that were in the final output, how many of them were selected from the internal filter? And in that case, it's B out of B and C. So we've got 50% for our internal filter efficiency. And what you really want to try and do is maximise both of those two efficiency ratings, your internal filter efficiency rating and your primary filter efficiency rating. And um, I'd just like to say, I can't remember if I said it at the beginning, but all of the T-SQL code I use to create those examples is all available for download, so you can go and, go and try experimenting yourself with different settings for the grid resolutions and see if you can get those, those figures maximised. Okay, so we've looked at the theory and the practice of spatial indexes. Now we'll get on to the stuff about what can you actually do to get your queries to perform faster? How do you get that primary filter to be efficient? Well, the first thing you need to do is to, you actually need to use a supported method. Uh, normally in SQL Server, when you create an index on a table, you don't need to worry too much about uh, how SQL Server uses it. You, you create the index, and when the query optimizer chooses what plan to use to run the uh, query, if that index results in the least cost query, it'll choose the index. You don't really think about it too much. It's not quite the same with spatial. Um, firstly, only certain spatial methods can make use of the index. ST intersects, which is what I've been using for all these examples, can, and so can the specific subtypes of intersection query as well, so contains within touches. Uh, you can also use ST distance so long as you are identifying geometries that lie within a certain distance of another. You can't use um, distances beyond a certain distance, okay, so that's distance closer than this. Um, and you can also use filter. Filters are an interesting method because filter essentially only uses the primary filter. Um, it doesn't go through that secondary filter stage of, of getting rid of the false positives. So filter will give you an approximate answer, or it may give you an approximate answer, based on a primary filter alone. Even when you've used uh, one of these methods, you've then got to use the right syntax. SQL Server's a little bit picky about the, uh, the syntax you use. And even though they're logically equivalent, um, you must write A intersects B equals 1, or true, rather than 1 equals A intersects B. That won't allow the index to be used. Um, so that's just something you just need to get right, basically. Um, now, in the original uh, RTM release of SQL Server 2008, there was a bit of a bug in the cost estimations that were applied to spatial queries. Um, as, you, as you probably know, um, when you execute a, a query in SQL Server, what happens is a number of different plans are created and a cost estimate is put with each of those plans and the plan with the least cost is the one that gets chosen to execute the query. Um, now, what was happening is essentially spatial indexes weren't being costed correctly and so sometimes the correct plan wasn't being chosen by the query optimizer. Now, Service Pack 1 um, does improve that situation slightly um, so if you haven't already upgraded to SP1, I do recommend that as a way of getting more reliable cost estimates. Even after having applied SP1, though, you may find that you still need to add a manual index hint to your queries. So rather than saying select star from table, you might need to do select star from table with and then the name of the index to force the query optimizer to use a spatial index. Um, otherwise, it just doesn't get picked up sometimes. Once you've made sure your index is being used, you need to make sure the index is effective. Remember, that there's three possible outcomes. There was that internal filter. We know this row can be included in the results. Or there's discarding it. We know this row definitely isn't in the results. And both of those two, from your point of view, are good things. That, those are the two outcomes that you want to be getting as a result of your primary filter. 
The secondary filter, where, well, we're not really sure we have to run the secondary filter, that's what's going to slow your queries down, okay? And what you need to do is you need to choose those index parameters, the bounding box, the grid resolutions at each of the four levels, and the cells per object, to match both the data in your table itself and also the sorts of queries that you execute against that table. Remember that what we're doing is we're making a comparison between two sorts of geometries, and those geometries must be tessellated according to the same index. One of the sort of common problems I see occurring most often is people who choose index settings based on the contents of the table alone. For example, if you've got a table that only contains points, you've got points of interest, and you, you might think for that example, the best index is going to be high at every resolution of the grid, high, 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 high. That's going to give you the smallest possible boxes, it's going to give you the least false positive results. The problem with that is though, if you then are trying to find out which of those points lies within a complex large shape, say Australia or something like that, you're going to be trying to get that polygon of Australia to match the same index settings as you had for your points in order to be able to do the comparison. That's not going to be a very good query. So have consideration for both. As a little demo of that, this was the results we had of our query earlier that had medium at all four levels of the grid. There's our four points, and there was our polygon. Let's see what would happen if we change that level four to be a high grid resolution instead. Essentially what would happen is every level four cell would become half as wide, half as high. So this is our new grid. And then when we do the tessellation on this grid, what happens? Well, points C and D over the right-hand side, they now partially intersect a cell, and it's a smaller cell. So you think, well, that's good. That's got to be a more accurate estimation when you use those. But points A and B, what they do is they now lie on the border of four cells, in fact. They're lying there. And each one of those cells, because being on the border counts as touching a cell and therefore intersecting it, every one of those four cells must be stored in the index. So the examples in that case hasn't become really any more accurate. And what's even worse is when we then come to tessellate the red polygon to that same index, we find out that we now need 36 cells to fully cover that shape, to fully describe that shape. Um, there's 32 partially or border cells around the edge, and there's four fully contained cells in the centre. And what that will probably do is that will blow your cells per object limit. As a result, uh, we'll start counting, and when we get to 16 cells that have been tessellated, or whatever your object limit is, we're going to stop the tessellation and we'll say, OK, we'll give up. That's a good enough approximation. And you'll only get the level 3 cell instead of, of fully going down to the level 4. So bear in mind not just what's in your table, but also the sort of queries that are running against it. Um, practical tip, how do you improve performance then? So you make the bounding box as tight as possible. If you shrink the bounding box to fit very tightly over your table of data, each individual grid cell within that bounding box is going to be smaller, and that will be more accurate. Having said that, you don't want to make your bounding box so small that you've got data that lies outside the bounding box, because if you have that, it's not going to be included in your index at all, and therefore you can't get the primary filter of that data. Um, as you've just seen on the last slide, if you increase the grid resolution of your indexes, you might need to increase the cells per object limit to go hand in hand with that uh, to make sure that you are allowing your index to fully tessellate your objects. You can have multiple indexes, um, and those can be at different resolutions. The example I like for this is suppose you've got um, a table of data that contains details of customers in Britain and in the US. And if you were to try to create a single index to index all of that data, what you'd end up doing is you'd draw a level one grid from the west coast of America over to the east coast of Britain. And a large part of what you'd be indexing would basically be the Atlantic Ocean, where you don't have any customers lying. Um, you'd probably get a lot better resolution if you had two indexes, one over mainland America and one over Britain, and then you just directed your query to use the appropriate um, index to satisfy the query. Use non-spatial predicates. By that, what I mean is that um, remember that you can use 
conditions, spatial conditions in the where clause of your query alongside, you know, normal T-SQL. So if you were to try to identify towns in Wales that had a population of greater than 10,000 people, for instance, the spatial component of that is probably going to be the more complex condition. So don't first identify all towns in Wales and then of those work out how many have got over 10,000 inhabitants. Cut down your data set first to identify just those towns that have got 10,000 inhabitants, then find out which of them in, in Wales and you'll probably get better performance. Uh, reduce unnecessary detail. Now, um, particularly when you download data off the internet um, or from other sources, you may find you don't get that much control over the level of detail that it comes in at. Um, although it doesn't make a difference to the primary filter, when you get to the secondary filter where you're actually comparing the point sets in both geometries, complicated shapes that have lots of unnecessary points are going to be a lot slower than simpler shapes. So if, you're, if you've got an application that has you know, global sales territories or something like that, where you really don't need you know, millimetre resolution of your objects, you can use the reduce method um, in SQL Server 2008, and what that will do is um, generalise shapes. So you've still got the overall shape of each of the points in your table, or the, the polygons in your table, but it's cut out a lot of the intermediate points that don't really add much to the shape, and that will make it a lot quicker. Um, and my final comment there is experiment. Um, spatial is still a new feature, certainly in the SQL Server 2008 world, it's very new. It's existed for a little bit longer in Oracle and, and DB2 and things like that, but people are still learning, really, uh, what the best way to do certain things is. There isn't much in the way of best practice yet, and it does depend a lot on the particular structure of your data and how you're using it. So. Don't be afraid to sort of try different settings and see really what works for you. Um, if you want to know any more, well, uh, like I said, there's um, beginning spatial. I've got a couple of copies here at the end. Um, if anyone asks a really good question, I might give them out. Or, um, there's also the MSDN Spatial Forum. Um, if you're not familiar with the MSDN Forums, they're really good places to go actually. A lot of the guys who are on the, the SQL Spatial team in America um, do check in very regular at the forums. They're very helpful and it's a good place to ask questions um, and there's lots of MVPs and, and myself and, and other people hang out there as well so it's a good place to ask questions. Uh, my email at the bottom, if any of you have any questions please do feel free to contact me. I'll do my, uh, my best to see if I can answer any, any questions. Um, like I say, I do encourage you really to, to go out and, and try it yourself because although you can see slides and pictures and things, it's, it's not quite the same as, uh, as trying it out yourself and seeing the results dynamically as you are to the boxes. So all the code, all the slides, everything is going to be on the SQL Bit website.